Greetings and felicitations. I would like to thank you for this eighth video, 8C. This video is dedicated to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And uh, we have quite a few things to go over, so let's go and let's get right into them. The first loose end that I would like to talk about is one that comes from the King James Only group. Every once in a while, you'll hear the King James Only say, well, the Codex Sinaiticus was a forgery done by Simonides back in 1836 or so. And, uh, you know, it's true that Simonides did claim to have forged the Codex Sinaiticus back in 1836, uh, but it's not true that he did so. Um, he lied. Uh, F. H. A. Scrivener, in his book, A Full Collation of Codex Sinaiticus with the Textus Receptus, and uses uh, Stephen's 1550 in this, in this book, uh, has an introduction, and in that introduction, he goes through Simonides' claim and shows that it is entirely fallacious. A very quick argument uh, would be that, um, for instance, back in 1790, an Italian adventurer named Victor Donatelli uh, actually saw the Codex Sinaiticus in St. Catharines long before Simonides claimed to have written it. So it's just not true that uh, when you hear somebody say that um, Simonides uh, uh, made this forgery, uh, it's just not true. Don't believe it. The second uh, point that I'd like to uh, address um, is something that Dr. White likes to talk about. Um, you'll find it on the John Ankerberg show. Um, you'll find Dr. White in his various lectures will, will mention it when he's talking about the majority text and the Textus Receptus. Uh, he says, and I'm going to quote here an article by Alan Kirshner, um, and this is essentially what Dr. White says in his, in his article, in his... Uh, in his well, in his articles as well as his uh, his speeches, um, it's uh, from an article written by Alan Kirshner on Dr. White's website. If you go on to his home page, you click James White, and then on the right hand side you click King James Onlyists. Uh, you'll find on page 13 an article that I'm flashing right now. It's called Eight Reasons Why It Is Fallacious for King James Only Advocates to Invoke the Majority Rule. The first reason and this is a point that Dr. White makes a lot too, is that there are 1,838 differences between the Textus Receptus and the majority text. And in their opinion, this constitutes such a wide gap between the two that you can't consider them to be in the same text type or um, the, the uh, Textus Receptus it can't be a, a part of the majority text or anything of that nature. Um, okay if we accept their arguments first. Why don't we apply them to the Alexandrian manuscripts, um, especially their two favorites, the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus? If there is such a wide difference in the whole of the Greek New Testament between the Textus Receptus and the majority text, then when we look, for instance, at the Codex Sinaiticus and the Codex Vaticanus, and we look only in four books of the New Testament, in the Gospels alone, there are 3,000 differences. Scholars have compiled this, and this is, this is common knowledge. Uh, Dr. White knows this. They acknowledge that this is the case. There are 3,000 differences in the Gospels alone between uh, Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. There are 1,838 differences in the entire New Testament between the Textus Receptus and the majority text. Now, if this 1,800 differences in the entire New Testament creates such a gap between these two, then what are we going to say about Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus? I mean, it seems pretty obvious that these two cannot be considered Alexandrian, or even in the same grouping, if you're going to make the same kind of argumentation. So, I mean, there's, there's that. Another reason why I'm, I'm not too keen on this is that uh, when I heard about it, I uh, emailed Dr. Daniel Wallace and I asked him for a listing. Can, can you give me a listing of these 1,838 differences? Um, Dr. Wallace uh, sent back an email and he said, well, you can, uh, well, I don't have a listing. You can just quote me as a, as a scholar and uh, that should be enough. Um, it's not enough for me. I am a Berean at heart and I hope all my Christian brothers out there are Bereans and they just won't take uh, what they say 
on face value, but you will investigate and see whether or not what they're saying is true. If there are 1,838 differences, and I have no doubt to believe that they, that they are, that there aren't, then post them. Post them on your website, Dr. White. Post them, uh, post them, Dr. Wallace. Let us see where these 1,838 differences lie. And let's see whether or not they are real differences or whether they are imaginary differences or maybe something that can be just reconciled. But I would like to see these 1,838 differences. If you're going to cite it, if you're going to cite the number, you should be able to cite the verses. All right? In this case, and I don't believe that King James only scholars are more powerful. I think that they are kind of weaker, a lot weaker, than um, critical text scholars like Wallace and, and White and them. Uh, but in this instance, the King James onlyists are out scholaring you. And here's the reason why. If I asked the King James onlyists, what are the differences in the Greek words between the majority te uh, between the Textus Receptus and the critical text? They show me proof uh, that this is that you, there are differences. They will show me proof. They will tell me there are eight thousand differences between the uh, Textus Rece uh, between the Greek words of the New King James and the modern translations, and they will cite this. That's all this book is. They will just cite all of the. Uh, the verses. And I can look them up. I can take a look at Luke 1 29 and say, okay, the Greek says this, and the Texas Receptus Greek says that. There's a difference. Uh, they, <laughs> in this case, they are out scholaring you. They are showing not only that, not only are they saying there are 8,000 differences, but they're showing those 8,000 differences. You're saying that there's 1,838 differences. Show me. You know, I hate to sound like a Missourian, <laughs> but uh, Actually, I don't, because the show-me state. Show me the differences, and I will believe them. Um, another reason why I don't hold to this is when we took a, take a look at the mathematics. Um, do pure subtraction, for example. Um, the, uh, there, if you subtract, well, according to Dr. Wallace, there are 140,000 words in the Greek New Testament. So you subtract 1,838 and you get something like 138,000 words. In other words, the uh, I hate to pun it, but um, there are similarities between the majority text and the Textus Receptus are 138,000 words, a little bit more than that, uh, in 140,000. Now, and you're saying that this is these don't these are not similar, okay? If we did percentages, 140,000. Uh, 1,838 divided by 140,000 is, is about 98%, and I'm rounding down. 98% uh, of the time, the Textus Receptus and the majority text agree. And you're telling me that there's no possible way that these two can be considered uh, from the same group or that the Textus Receptus can't be considered majority text. I'm not buying it. Okay. In the next segment, what we are going to look at is we are going to look at the challenge that um, Alan Kirshner, Dr. White, lay down concerning uh, why there aren't any extant New Testament uh, Byzantine manuscripts. So let's go to the next. Uh... Why are there no extant Greek manuscripts? Well, um, Alan Kirshner, in another article of his, of his on James White's website, entitled um, Dean Bergen's Phantom Manuscripts, which I'm flashing here, will tell you, um, will ask you the question. And uh, he says that uh, one of the most bizarre arguments made is uh, Dean Bergen's argument that the manuscripts became worn out. Um, and to Alan Kirshner, this is a bizarre argument and these are phantom manuscripts. And uh, I want to point out that these are pejorative statements that um, Alan Kirshner is making. They are not statements that should be used to uh, argue for a point. And um, he makes these statements uh, probably to bias you against the, 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 uh, the, uh, the uh, Texas Receptus. So anyway, worn out, okay. <laughs> Why is this a bizarre argument, Dr. Uh, Kirshner? And I will ask you another question uh, in order to point this out, that it's not bizarre. Um, what happened to the autographs? 
just about every textual scholar that I have read, whether you're talking about Metzger or Ehrman or even James White, will tell you that the original autographs were worn out because they were, they were written on, they were copied. They were copied and copied and copied. And these copies were copied and copied and copied. Uh, so they get worn out because they're being used. All right. Uh, Dr. Uh, Frederick Kenyon, here's a flash of, of a statement uh, of that he makes, um, points out that the Jewish understanding of uh, the transmission of manuscripts would be that the, when the older manuscripts became too worn out to be used, they were recopied. And the older manuscripts were put away. They were put in a Geniza, and the Geniza was uh, eventually cleaned out. They were buried or they were burned or something like that. And the newer manuscripts were considered more authoritative than the older ones because they were newer, because they contained the original uh, readings that you find in the older manuscripts. So they were considered more authoritative because the older manuscripts were worn out. This is not a bizarre argument. They are not phantom man manuscripts. The manuscripts in the Byzantine tradition were destroyed, okay, either by the Geniza or, my second reason, um, Diocletian. And Diocletian's uh, in 301 AD uh, made an edict stating that he wants uh, all the Christian books to be destroyed, to be burned. So this is probably what happened. The Genesis in the church at the time were cleaned out by the Romans. The Christians would save the newer manuscripts and put them in floorboards or wherever, um, hide them somewhere, and uh, they would give the Romans the older manuscripts, which they were going to destroy anyway. And thus the, uh, thus the, the uh, New Testament was preserved from the Roman uh, soldiers who were burning the manuscripts. So the older manuscripts were all destroyed by Diocletian. This is a fact. It's a historical fact that you can read in any church history book. Well, just about any church history. More scholarly church history books, put it that way. And the final reason is the wet climate. All right, if you took a book, uh, a New Testament Greek manuscript, and you buried it up in uh, Asia Minor or in Greece or somewhere up there where there's a lot of rainfall, they're going to decompose real quick. If you took a, mag a book or uh, a manuscript and you put it in a clay pot and you put it in a, uh, <clears throat> in a cave uh, in the desert like they did with the Dead Sea Scrolls, they would be preserved. If you put them on a shelf in a, in a, in a, in a uh, monastery, they would be preserved, just like the, 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 uh, the uh, Codex Sinaiticus. If you put them in a garbage dump, like Oxyrhynchus, in the middle of a desert, they will be preserved because of the arid climate. I mean, these are reasons that I, I have read from King James, uh, King James Onlyus, as well as majority text scholars. Uh, Bergen and Scrivener will say the same things. So, <clears throat> It's pretty. It, this is, these are the reasons why we don't have extant Greek manuscripts in the Byzantine tradition uh, that is, that um, that you find, at least in the critical text of views, uh, the philosophy of the critical text. I don't believe in the Byzantine manuscripts. I believe in their readings. So anyway, thank you very much for watching. Uh, may God bless you. And this video is for Christ and Christ alone. Amen.